Islamic Art at Present Time. In this final chapter, I have tried to put into historical and art historical perspective what we see in the Middle East today. Since the research on the content of this chapter is ongoing, you should consider this chapter a work in progress while keeping in mind the historical context of the current artistic products that are discussed. The 19th and the 20th centuries are critical times in understanding the current events in the Middle East. By the same token, these critical times determine the path, pace, and the conditions by which visual arts specifically took shape in the region and in diaspora. As you witnessed previously, Napoleonic campaign to Egypt had repercussions, but its lasting influence was not restricted to Egypt. It could also be seen in the 19th century Iran and Turkey, just to name two more examples. With the fall of the Ottoman Empire at the hands of the Europeans as it was spearheaded by Britain, Middle East was broken up into regions that transformed the Middle East's geography to what we see on the maps today. What the British did in order to achieve their goal of dismantling the largest and most powerful Islamic empires was to invoke, or some argue, to create a sense of nationalism among the inhabitants of the Middle East, as there were many different ethnicities under the Ottoman rule. Therefore, they successfully invested in the message that each nation should be independent, and that sounded great to the Arabs, for instance, who started asking the question of why were they being ruled by the Turks? The same message, nationalism, brought about a wave of nationalistic movements that swept through the region and led to the formation of strong central authority in many of the large countries in the region such as Egypt, Iran and ultimately Turkey itself in the early part of the 20th century. Parallel to strengthening a central governing force in each of these countries, I mentioned as example Parallel to strengthening a central governing force in each of these countries, I mentioned as examples, was the move toward modernization, starting with the fields of military and education. Of course, this meant that some of the traditional ways that conflicted with this progression had to be eliminated. Had to be eliminated in order for modernization to take hold. It is interesting to see how the Middle East dealt with this modernization movement problem. When Western technology brought with it Western influence, it was met with a reactionary attitude on the parts of the Middle Easterners. Two groups were formed as a result. One group that among them were first One group that among them were the first Middle Easterners who had either gone to Europe to get educated or had come in contact with Europeans and witnessed the fruits of modernization, advocated the integration of all things Western into the Middle East regardless of the existing traditions that almost entirely conflicted with such, moder modern with such modernization on every level. This regardless of the existing traditions that almost entirely conflicted with such modernization on every level. This is seen, of course, as a positive viewpoint. The other reactionary approach is from the side of the traditionalists who felt that they were going to be stripped away of their faith and religion but that they could resist it by ignoring it and turning away from it to maintain order within and preserve their traditions and beliefs, which of course the issue of belief and religion maintain which of course the issue of belief and religion remains an important part of the equation to this day. 
On the most visible front came the question of visual imagery. Western civilization that had relied on visual imagery in so many different capacities for centuries and of course had become very good at it, as argued by some, was seen as superior in this respect in comparison to the rest of the world. Hence the question of imagery and its status. Hence the question of imagery and its sta hence the question of imagery and its status in the Middle East due to the pre-existing understanding of the prohibition of figurative imagery accepted by all Islamic regions and sects was brought forth, which started the discourse of whether that understanding could be modified in some way for the sake of modernization. Thus, the religious leaders took up this challenge and critically argued that the prohibition of imagery was initiated due to the practice of idolatry in the past. And since they deemed idolatry as non-issue in their time, the progressive religious leaders did not see imagery as a problem. We come across religious leaders advocating reformation. Among such progressive and influential leaders are Sayyid Jamal al-Din Asad Abadi and Muhammad Abdo, who as religious leaders were respected and looked up to in the region. They both wanted a reformation movement initiated among the Muslims and supported some type of modernization in the region. Muhammad Abdo had the power to issue fatwa or religious edict. He tirelessly used his power to argue in support of the arts, for instance. Sayyid Jamal also supported the ideas of democracy and individual freedoms and developed a critical perspective on the historical evolution of the Middle Eastern people. He essentially believed there was a correlation between the socio-political as well as cultural evolutionary movements in the Western civilization and saw no reason that the same pattern wouldn't apply for the people of the Middle East. I must mention that artistic influence from the West had already permeated the visual arts, especially painting in regions such as Iran. As this portrait of the Qajar king, Fatali Shah, who ruled from 1797 to 1834, testifies, the depiction of figures in space reveals an interest in the linear perspective and modeling, meaning shading to create volume on a flat surface, as seen in and adopted from European paintings. The visual art and technology presented a challenge to the religious authorities in the region who had not really given the subject much thought before. Another field associated with technology, printing, first appeared in Ottoman Turkey in 1727, although it did not include the reproduction of the Muslim holy book, Quran at first. Lithography was the process used in Iran to reproduce the Quran, but that did not take place until in 1830. Photography is yet another significant field that was introduced in the late 19th century. Although there are photographs of kings and dignitaries taken in Europe during their visits abroad from much earlier, from the second half of the 19th century, there are images taken in domestic surroundings or photographer's studio as well. Regardless of resistance from the ulama or religious authorities, innovation and progress, although at a slow pace in some parts, took place in the Middle East and the strong nationalistic tendencies yielded a new middle class that was also supportive of progressive movements. Throughout the modernization movement in the region, students were sent to Europe to study various subjects including painting, architecture, and sculpture. Among these students was Muhammad Qafouri, known as Kemal al-Mulk, whose dates are 1852 to 1940, and who was sent to Europe to study painting. In one of his paintings, he depicts another Qajar king, a later Qajar king, Nasser al-Din Shah in one of the rooms in his palace, his famous Hall of Mirrors. 
Kamal al-Mulk's painting clearly demonstrates his masterful execution of depicting a room filled with mirrors in the most accurate manner, consistent and compatible with those among his contemporary European counterparts that were, of course, more faithful to the that were of course more faithful to ju that were of course more faithful to traditional style because as we know by this time modernist movements had already influenced and generated new styles in the visual arts in Europe while this would not be a modern example in style it represents a change in Iranian traditional painting in that there is certainly preoccupation with linear perspective, something that was not really a concern in the Persian miniature painting before. It is noteworthy that modern artistic movements can be seen in Islamic lands starting as early as the first half of the 20th century. In architecture, Western influence became predominantly seen in secular buildings while for the religious structures, modern modification was made to the traditional plans maintaining some of the traditional features. In the uh, Stiklal Mosque in Indonesia built in 1955 that was built in celebration of the new independent state, the only remaining traditional features are the dome and the minarets. If we remove these two features, the building does not look much different than an office building from the 50s with its austere exterior and lack of ornamentation. The courtyard and the covered walkway, though, the courtyard and the covered walkway, though, are reminiscent of historical hypostyle plan, but with a modern twist. The interior space with the fluted columns and polished stone finish and minimal decoration seems consistent with the modern tendencies. Architecture was not the only field influenced by modern movements. It is also seen in sculpture. This sculpture by Mahmoud Mukhtar called Egyptian Awakening, dated 1919 to 28, is carved from granite and harkens back to the ancient and harkens back to the ancient Egyptian stone carvings. Mukhtar uses the classical motif of the Sphinx that is clearly associated with Egyptian civilization and heritage, but personifies Egypt as a woman who is lifting up her veil. Mukhtar's work is compared with sculptures produced in communist Russia in its austerity and geometric and geometric geometricization and geometricization of the natural forms. There's also allusion to Art Nouveau, another European 20th century another European 20th century artistic movement in its elongated proportions and clean lines. Use of three-dimensional art and monument Use of three-dimensional art and monuments in public places has a long history and tradition and its value to promote a specific political view or for the purpose of propaganda has long been recognized. Middle Eastern art in this respect is no different. In a monument built following the first few years of Iraq-Iran war in the 1980s, Saddam Hussein commissioned Ismail Fatah to create the monument Shaheed in honor of the Iraqis killed in the conflict. Fatah designed this monument to be a giant turquoise colored dome that has been cut in half. His creation, while reminiscent of the traditional dome structure, is innovative in its scale and context. In the field of two-dimensional arts, of course, there are plenty of examples of which I already mentioned Kamal al-Mulk's painting of the Hall of Mirrors for the Qajar King. But many of the artists who are from the region of Middle East migrated to the Western countries and settled there. 
artists who come from the Middle East or have some connections to the region but live and work in other countries, particularly in Western countries, represent the art in diaspora. While many of them do not really consider their art Islamic, understandably, their works represent ideas and elements from the Islamic artistic and historical concerns. Two of these artists are Shazia Sikandar from Pakistan and Shirin Nishat from Iran. The Pleasure Pillars from 2001 holds within many familiar elements. The Pleasure Pillars from The Pleasure Pillars from 2001 holds within many familiar elements from the Mughal paintings from the Mughal painting to Safavid painting to even classical antiquity. Shazia's work reflects Ref reflects references from her artistic and cultural background while her interpretations of such works are analytic and modern. Clearly different in her approach, Shirin Nishat's work is very much about the contemporary culture and its sensibilities. In her photograph called Speechless from 1993, she focuses on the image of a woman, possibly an Iranian woman, impacted by the 1978 revolution that imposed many unfair laws against women in Iran. Over her face is handwritten calligraphy revealing a eulogy to martyrdom, which is very much contemporary which is very much a contemporary concept in Iran after the revolution, while the barrel of a gun is taking the shape, is taking the place of her earring next to her face and ear, interpreted a sign of looming fear, interpreted as a sign of looming fear associated with the new legal restrictions on personal freedoms of women. Finally, in 2005, I had an opportunity to curate, to curate a show of the works of a talented Iranian artist residing in the Bay Area. For this project, I was able to see and interview the artist during his exhibit at Ridley Gallery at Sierra College at that time. Sayed Alavi, who considers himself an artist of concepts, explained to me the idea behind his work, Essence. In essence, Alavi brings together a series of uniquely shaped hand-blown glass bottles that hold within rainwater from all over the world. The individual name tags identify from where to from where the content of each bottle had come. The individual name tags identified from where the content of each bottle had come. While he placed these bottles in various places, some high up on a pedestal, some low on the ground, some grouped, some by themselves, he reminds us that no matter where we come from or what we may look like, we are all the same on the inside. Hence, our essence is the same. Alavi's work reveals a mystic concept that hopefully you all remember from the second chapter. The Sufis believe that humans have all come from the same place and all hold within the same essence. By not making any of the materials himself, the glass was made by another artist at the instruction of Alavi, Alavi de-emphasizes the whole idea of technical virtuosity that everyone expects artists to have and to be judged by. Rather, he underscores the idea behind it all. What I would like to end our lecture, what I would like to end our lecture, our topic and our semester with is What I would like to end our lecture 
our topic and our semester with. What I would like to end our lecture, our topic, and our semester with is perhaps what I think is the most profound understanding that one could take away from the Islamic culture and civilization in its essence through this course. The initial idea introduced by Islam can be seen and interpreted as a critical viewing of its precursors in how they managed to manipulate people and justify ruling over them through art and philosophy. It should be clear to us by now how important and crucial the relationship between power and the production of the art is, and how instrumental the power of art has been in order to preoccupy and impress individuals to submit and to relinquish their beliefs, rights, and freedoms. Unfortunately, Islam too fell into the same trap by becoming dynastic, but not before through its essential message Atawheed, leaving us the critical thinking tools we need to view art. The way I understand it, the essence of Islam is that in the message of Atawheed, there is an emphasis on human potential and individual rights and freedoms that must be respected, because according to this principle, no one then can claim to be above the rest. Or putting it another way, if the belief is that there is one God beyond all creation, no one, can, no one can put any claims on it to achieve any superiority. However, by shifting this emphasis to what humans create, meaning art and the philosophy that goes along with it to justify it, one can fall victim to social hierarchy and despotism. What we can do is to always stay open and critical of all artworks we see and not just be overwhelmed by their beauty, scale, or virtuosity.